broadcasting. In the lighter way, uh, uh, you're now taking the trip of all trips of mankind. Can I ask each one of you, which place would you like to go to for vacation when you come back to Earth? Well, I, I think that the situation being what it is now, the place I would most like to go immediately is the Lunar Receiving Laboratory. <laughs> if, if, I am, if I'm able to go there, we will have succeeded. I wonder if each of the three could tell us very briefly how your families have reacted to the fact that you're taking this historic mission. Well, I think uh, in my particular case, uh, my family has had five years now to uh, become accustomed to uh, this eventuality and over six months to, uh, to face it quite closely. And uh, I think they, they look on this as a tremendous challenge for me. They look up upon it also as a, uh, an invasion somewhat of their privacy and a uh, removing of my presence away from the family for a considerable period of time. And, uh, I'm not sure exactly uh, whether this is the overriding feature uh, over and above uh, some of the uh, other more pleasant aspects of uh, particular job that I have as far as uh, it affects my family. Uh, Neil, uh, Marvin Miles, Los Angeles Times. I'd like to know, I understand, I understand that you're going to take manual control of the descent. Can you tell us at what point, how low you will take that control, how far you will burn down, and how low you could stage in the board and go to apps if necessary? Um, we, we have made some significant improvements in, in the flight control system and the computer's interaction with that system in re recent months. Uh, allows us to go into somewhat hybrid methods of manual and automatic. Uh, the predicted method at this point although we have a great deal of flexibility and choice based on the, on the situation at the time, would be to uh, maintain manual control of attitude and automatic control of throttle uh, through the final descent from an altitude of uh, somewhere between 500 and 1,000 feet until such time as the automatic throttling rate of descent was unsatisfactory at which time we'll go full manual on the throttle, that is, rate of descent command on the throttle, which is operating through the computer. Should that become unsatisfactory, then we can go to a full manual throttle, uh, flying it in a manner like a normal VTOL machine would be flown. So 500 feet is a good... That went down here. James Burke, BBC. You have mentioned that your flight, like all others, contains very many risks. What, in view of that, will your plans be in the extremely unlikely event that the lunar module does not come up off the lunar surface? Well, that's an unpleasant thing to think about. We've chosen not to think about that up to the present time. We, uh, we don't think that's at all a likely situation. It's certainly a possible one. But uh, at the present time, we're left without recourse at that account. Colonel Waldron, uh, on Apollo 8, uh, you were the uh, command module pilot in the backup crew. And this one, you're the lunar module pilot. How interchangeable in your preparation for this, or for that matter, in the flying of it, are the uh, roles of the crew? Well, at the uh, stage that we're at right now, I think they're not very interchangeable. <laughs> uh, prior to uh, my assignment as backup uh, command module pilot on Apollo 
eight, uh, we were together as uh, in slightly different roles, and it was, if I'm not mistaken, because uh, Mike was dropped out of the uh, mission that uh, we had an adjustment of the crews that, that put me from the lunar module pilot into the command module pilot's position. Uh, for Apollo 8, uh, there was no lunar module, so this was not much of an adjustment. Uh, it was just moving from uh, an emphasis on systems to more in, in navigation. Now, since I had previous training uh, to some degree in the lunar module, why then moving back into that position was was not too difficult a task. Everyone yeah, on the far side. Uh, Mr. Armstrong, uh, er earlier there was some concern expressed that uh, you were rushed to get in all your training necessary for this flight. What is the, uh, uh, the state of your training readiness now? The, uh, the reason that that was a concern is that the, the final training for a crew is the last thing that takes place. In other words, the procedures must be developed and the simulations completely set up and the simulators ready to fly and the checklists made and so on before the final training can take place. And these, of course, were the pacing items, these intermediate things to the final training. At this point in time, uh, we have a high confidence level that the procedures and uh, checklists, simulations that we are now operating are correct and will fly the mission the way they are now detailed. So, uh, of, of course, there was a good deal of concern in our own minds and, and many other people in, in the organization that all these things for the descent, ascent, surface work would fall into place in time. We do uh, feel at this point that we've been very fortunate in, in, in having those things uh, make the schedule along with the with the hardware, which of course is on the pad now and ready to fly. Yes, you were speaking of, you were speaking a few minutes ago about naming the spacecraft Columbia and so on. Do you have any plans to name the site where you land? That is to say the immediate area where you land. Will you give it any name or, or not? Um as on previous flights, we, uh, in the absence of official names for various locations and landmarks on the lunar surface, have have chosen to use some some unofficial names for our recognition purposes and for our training purposes. We'll continue to do that. One more over here, Mr. Armstrong. There's been some discussion of the possibility that with uh, almost 10 hours interposed between the time of the landing and the scheduled uh, uh, moonwalk that uh, the crew may become a little bit impatient and uh, may start early. How do you now assess that situation? Well, in the, in the past, I guess, on our flights, we've demonstrated a somewhat more than the average ability to change our mind and do things late or early or shift things around, maintain as much flexibility as possible. And uh, I suppose that we would like to maintain that possibility now. Before the flight, we'd like to try to do just the opposite, get things set as firmly as possible in all our procedures and then attempt to stick with them. But should the circumstances at the time indicate that we can better achieve our objectives by by using the information that we're gaining at the time we're doing things, then we'd certainly like to reserve that possibility, and uh, I certainly wouldn't like to discount that, that this time. Someone right here. Jorge Ruiz Aguilar, Núcleo Radio Mil, Mexico. An item of unusual interest 
in the in the nearby area that would want inspection uh, at the expense of of other of our planned tasks, we would certainly want to retain the freedom to make that inspection and uh, within our ability to get to the location necessary to do that why we would certainly like to. I can't at this time say what such an object might be, but if it were an animal, I'm quite sure we would zip over there and take a look. Or maybe we'd go the other way. <laughs> Uh, tell me about the French TV news. This is a question for uh, Buzz Aldrin. How can you figure out the uh, chances of total success of moon landing and liftoff as far as the LAM and all systems in the LAM are concerned? I would figure the chances are quite high. To be more specific, uh, I wouldn't have the uh, first idea to go about really how to calculate these. I think the fact that uh, we've had uh, considerable success in our vehicles is indicative of what we hope will follow. Uh, we certainly have the utmost confidence of uh, total success. We have one in the front row here. What behind you? Back, second row. Uh, I'd like to know uh, what kind of surface do you expect from the moon? Uh, for example, color, uh, the size of particles, or size of uh, boulders, and so on. I'd like to know uh, uh, Mr. Armstrong's opinion and uh, Mr. Aldrin's opinion, both. So, fortunately, we don't think we have to guess. Uh, I suspect we may be surprised in some detail, but uh, uh, the color is, is uh, something uh, that is predicted to be uh, gray. Now, various crews in the past have called this bluish gray and brownish gray and greenish gray and uh, maybe slight shades of tans and so on, but we suspect that those, those colors uh, will manifest themselves in close, uh, close inspection. The size of the particles will probably be largely very small, sandy, fine, fine particles, but we do hope and expect to see some rock fragments. Uh, uh, and I have no idea what size they might be, but we would anticipate that we'll have, uh, be able to bring samples back up to and including the size of a golf ball or maybe larger rocks are in the vicinity, but we wouldn't expect to bring back samples, large samples. I think both the uh, answers to your questions have pretty well been borne out by the uh, surveyor program, uh, indicating a very fine grain uh, cohesive material uh, with an abundance of varying sizes and varying shapes of uh, a harder uh, rock material. And uh, the colors, I'm sure, upon close inspection will, will be a little bit different, perhaps, than just plain gray. I'm sure there will be some definite color to the uh, uh, crystalline structures of the rocks. Uh, I have a two-part question. One, have either any of you had any cold, sniffles, gastrointestinal upsets, or anything else in the past month? And two, uh, are you carrying anything at all new or different in your medical kits this time? I don't think we've had any illnesses in the crew. Uh, can't say that we may not have individually had a sniffle or a stuffed up nose sometime in the past month or two. I, that may be the case. Uh, I don't know that, I'm not sufficiently familiar with the, the, the medicines carried in the 10 and 9 uh, kits to say that there's anything different in ours. I, uh, is, is, do you, anybody know? I don't think that there are. If there's any new differences, they're small ones. Uh, yeah. The motion sickness 
pills have changed their chemical composition slightly. They used to be merazine and now they're a combination of dexedrine and some other thing I can't recall the name of, but I'm sure the medics would be happy to provide you that information. Uh, <clears throat> I'd like to ask uh, Neil Armstrong if he agrees with a congressional mandate which specifies that the U.S. flag and only the U.S. flag be implanted on the moon on Apollo 11. Well, uh, I suspect that if we asked all the people in the audience and all of us up here, all of us would give different ideas on what they would like to take to the moon and think should be taken. Uh, everyone within the, his, his own experience and it's, I, uh, I don't think that uh, there's any question about what our job is. Uh, our job is to uh, fly the spacecraft as best as we can. And uh, we, did, we never would suggest that it was our responsibility to suggest what the United States posture on the moon would, would be. And uh, I think that's probably within that that decision has been made where it should be made, namely in the, in the Congress of the, the country, I, I wouldn't presume to question it. Ellis Swayze, Beaumont Enterprise. On previous moon flights, astronauts have been pretty busy with such maneuvers as docking and rendezvousing and this sort of thing. I presume it's rehearsal for this trip. Uh, am I correct in assuming this time that your flight up will be relatively quiet I'm sorry, I didn't. Did you catch that question? I, I'm sorry, I couldn't understand the question. Uh, on pre previous moon flights, the astronauts have been uh, busy with such maneuvers as docking and rendezvousing and this sort of thing. Uh, uh, in rehearsal for this particular flight, will there be a minimum of that sort of thing on this flight? Well, they're certainly equally important to this flight as they have been to all others, uh, I think the only uh, difference is that due to the work done on the previous flights, we probably uh, did not need to concentrate so much on those phases in our training, nor will we be, should we be surprised if those activities go as, as we plan them to go. Uh, Nick Chris with the Los Angeles Times. I know your main concern now is only getting to the moon and getting back, but I wonder if you could tell us just briefly what you think the uh, role of the country space program is going to be in the next few years and what roles you would like to play in it. Where is going, in other words, not after the next lunar shots, but five, ten, eight years from now? That's a very big question. And uh, one, the subject to which a good deal of attention has been directed in, in recent months and part of our agency and Department of Defense and Space Council and the administration and the Congress. Uh, and there's a very active interest by, by the people of the nation, too, in what direction this effort that has been mounted over the last decade shall be, shall be pointed. Uh, I wish that I could have had the time in recent months to uh, listen to, to those discussions and participate in them. I'm, I suspect that uh, many of you are, are much more up to date than, than we are in terms of those kinds of programs. Uh, I, I certainly think that the direction uh, that we will go is beginning to gel. I see evidences at our level that, that people are beginning to home in on things that look practical. Uh, and uh, I don't know what those, those agency and national decisions will be at this point, but uh, certainly all the front runners, space station, the... Uh, Space shuttle, the lunar shuttle, 
advanced lunar exploration and the early planetary explorations are, are the contenders to reckon with, and I certainly think that those will be the ones from which our, our early goals are, are selected. Uh, Daily Mail, London. Two questions. Firstly, what precautions have been taken at your own homes to prevent you catching germs from your own families? And secondly, is this the last period you, you'll spend at home here with your families? Take back that mic. My wife and children have signed a statement that they have no germs and... Uh, <laughs> Yes, this will be the, the last weekend that we'll be home with our family. So seriously, there are, there are no special precautions being taken. I suppose if one of the kids came down with measles or some childhood disease, which we uh, had not had previously, then we would uh, take measures to separate ourselves from them. However, in the absence of some uh, overt evidence that they're ill, uh, we are taking no precautions. Two questions. Uh, what do you anticipate will be the most difficult task that you have to perform during your walk on the moon? And second, what do you plan to do in your spare time when you're back in the LRL, when you're cooped up all this time <laughs> in between deep briefings and business? With regard to the first question, most probably the most difficult part of the Lunar surface work isn't on the surface, it's in the LEM cockpit. It's the preparation for the activities on the surface the, uh, and the work subsequent to the EVA when we again have to, to operate the pressurized suit inside the, the lunar module cockpit. Those are certainly the most difficult, possibly the most tiring, and uh, certainly the most potentially hazardous of, of, the, of the things that go on. Not generally recognized by the average bystander because it's difficult for those activities, those long preparation activities, to be adequately displayed to, to someone uh, due to the close confines of the cockpit. But it's certainly, a, I think, uh, one that, that we view with uh, a good deal of, of caution, one part of the flight that we do with extreme care, and, and uh, one that at this point in time we have high confidence in success of. Now, the second question with respect to the LRL, fortunately, I guess the activities will be very much like the activities uh, subsequent to any other flight in terms of their mechanical detail. It's post-flight schedule in terms of briefings, debriefings with various interested groups of, uh, of the program will take place just as though uh, just as though they have on previous flights. The only difference will be that our communication will be via TV link and, uh, and hired wire rather than face-to-face -face as we are here today. Point to uh, the first question. Uh, difficult things in EVA should be anticipated. We have attempted to anticipate all difficult things and to make them as easy as possible. I think the most critical portion of the EVA is will be our ability to anticipate and to interpret things that appear not to be as we expected them to be. Because if we don't interpret them correctly, then they will become difficult. Mr. Armstrong, at the time you step down on the moon, what will be your overriding consideration and what will be your main concern? Mm -hmm. Well, immediately upon touchdown, our concern is the integrity of the lunar module itself. And uh, probably wise to point out that 
immediately after touchdown. And, uh, and as a matter of fact, for the first two hours after touchdown, we have a very busy time verifying the integrity of the lunar module and all its systems. Without that integrity, of course, we are unable to complete the remaining objectives and we cannot safely continue with the, the lunar surface work and we cannot safely again return uh, to lunar orbit. So that, of course, is the most important thing and it'll, it, it will evidence itself to you all here by a great deal of uh, technical discussions about systems between the spacecraft and the ground uh, during a time period when most people will be wondering, well, what does it look like out there, or what do you see? And we understand that desire for everyone to know those kinds of things that I'm sure we'll be eager to comment on, but reluctant to do so in the face of these more important considerations on which the success of the entire rest of the lunar mission depends. 